G'day folks and welcome to Great Chesterford Junction. Uh, this update is uh, a reshot version of an update that we've uh, just had in the last couple of days. And the reason for that is that approximately, I would say, estimate maybe 30% of the uh, people who've watched the video are having problems with the sound. Uh, it's dropping in and out or very, very low. So obviously there's some sort of glitch in the system somewhere. Um, it's probably at my end, I would assume. So uh, mind you, everything plays fine on my system and when I upload to YouTube it all plays back fine for me so uh, I don't really understand what the issue is so uh, I've looked at all my settings and so on and I've uh, reconfirmed the YouTube settings so I'm making sure that uh, everything matches up so I've gone back to basics here and uh, I'm changing the way that I'm actually putting the video together um, using stuff that I know works so uh, we'll we'll kick off and we'll see how it goes so um, if there are any issues especially with sound uh, please let me know if you don't like the color of my shirt don't bother telling me that uh, or if you don't like the shape of my beard <laughs> just uh, keep, let's keep it to the technical details okay right good one so, um, reshooting this. Now, I don't work off a script, so I've got to try and sort of do all this again. So, for anyone who's already seen the first lot, this might be a bit different. So, here we go. Um, yes, I mentioned in my uh, September update that uh, I was going to start some work on Little Bardfield here. And uh, so, uh, I've, I've started doing that. And uh, I can show you... A slideshow hopefully uh, which will sort of um, document visually the uh, the way I've gone about uh, building up this area of the layout so fingers crossed let's move across to the computer and uh, see how it goes right folks so um, what we did here on Little Bardfield was originally we had a left hand point in this situation here so um, to get a better flow of track like this out here I needed to change that over to a right hand point so this is a right hand electro frog point and there's additional wiring under there to uh, improve the electrical uh, conductivity of the uh, of the point uh, plus feeder wires down to um, eventually go to uh, a micro switch to set it up but you can see the old line of track along that line there and it shows up uh, better in this picture here so that's where the track was originally so um, I've got a better flow of, of track along there now once the boards are off uh, I need to make a lever frame as I've made before in the past and uh, in this case it'll be five levers and it consists of the uh, laser cut lever um, handles here that um, I had made and uh, we also use uh, terminal block inners, brass terminal block inners there's some small three millimeter black screws uh, we need also nylock nuts uh, flat washers and spring washers for the uh, frame and for the lever we need these very small uh, flat washers to um, uh, keep the uh, term terminal block inners off the actual lever so it rotates properly and uh, the process is quite simple you just feed a black screw through the lever place a flat washer on there we we give it a drop of um, loctite uh, thread locker before putting the uh, uh, the uh, terminal block inner on there and the, uh, the thread locker uh, keeps that in place very well that's the uh, loctite 263 thread locker that I use it's very effective and there we've got our five levers ready to go so the next thing of course is to make the frame and it's the same process I've used before a bit of 3 16th rod fitted onto a small uh, right angle bracket uh, one end is locked in with two nylock nuts spring washers flat washers etc 
and then you start feeding the uh, levers on one by one. So the process is that the first piece you need on is a spring washer, then a flat washer, then the lever, flat washer, then a spring washer. And uh, the idea is that when you bring a nut up to that, it compresses the spring washers and puts a reasonable amount of pressure onto the lever to hold it in place. And this is a friction system, so friction is necessary. So when we bring that nut up, we have a bit of... Um, thread locker on here as well even though they're nylock nuts and they're supposed to lock in position I just want a bit of insurance to ensure that that nut doesn't move once it's in position once I've set it up so that's the finished frame and all we have to do is cut the uh, thread off here to finish it off and uh, all these levers as they're placed on and tightened up I try and achieve the same amount of friction in each one so it's, it's hard to describe how much it is, but uh, the lever needs to move freely, uh, not too freely, uh, yet retain some sort of friction to hold the point blades. And that's the frame finished. And of course, uh, you, if you start pushing these levers towards the back of the box that they're in, they're, they're difficult to get your fingers around. So this uh, bit of angle acts as a stopper behind the levers. Uh, so that's a bit of uh, 10 mil um, aluminium angle. So that limits the throw forward of the levers and makes it easier to um, pull them back. And this is the position where the uh, eventual lever frame will go. And I need to take a considerable amount of material out of this section. So this bit here at the bottom will only be 20 millimeters thick. And uh, I need to reinforce that. So I've used a bit of um, two by one timber, just a bit of rough timber, screwed it in, glued it in as well. And uh, hopefully that'll do the job and support the frame properly there. This is the area that has to be removed and uh, it's uh, fairly big so it's as big as the lever frame box this is the material that the uh, box will be made out of now this uh, large piece of uh, pine here is actually a, an old drawer front i don't throw stuff away folks and uh, this piece here was uh, actually put through the table saw and uh, reduced to this size and it was used as baseboard uh, framing at some stage but this is rough cut so it will need to be cleaned up and uh, I've got some sort of sizes on there to indicate what I'm working with. So once uh, the uh, rough cut timber was put through a thicknesser, which is uh, a big electric plane basically, once it was put through the thicknesser, some material was taken off and we get down to this nice planed surface uh, that's nice to work with and uh, gives us a good feel for the box. And here we are. Uh, putting the thing together, working out uh, measurements, etc. The box is basically bigger than the frame, so we just work it out and try and uh, keep a consistent sort of look to it. This uh, piece of aluminium angle here is going on the front section, which is removable, and also uh, there will be some combing that will be glued to the top of that. And uh, being on the front of the box and removable, what it allows me to do is actually uh, lift it off and get good access to the workings inside. This is the back being produced and there's a cut out here for the bottom of the levers uh, to give a bit more clearance for them. And then we're fitting them in place, etc. Everything's going along, along nicely here so that's the um, uh, support for the combing there on the, on the front piece. And we've also uh, rounded off the uh, corners here because uh, working in confined spaces, you don't want sharp edges around anywhere, and especially with children around as well. Uh, this will be at uh, little kids' head height, so uh, we don't want any little uh, heads banging into these things and getting an injury. And uh, that's pretty much where we're put together. We just need now to um, put some rockers on the back and uh, and then uh, we'll be finished so yeah it's all set to go here and the rockers are pretty much following the same process as the levers although I have to make these myself I don't get them laser cut so these rockers are determined by the uh, the height of the box and how far it sits below the baseboard 
Uh, it has three holes in it, basically, a hole at each end and a hole in the, mid in the middle for it to pivot on. So to drill the holes accurately, I've got a table which fits on my drill, drill press and uh, there's a fence on that and I can fit a stopper to it so that I can uh, drill accurately each time. So each uh, rocker is drilled in this way. And uh, the drilling of the aluminium sort of creates a burr in the aluminium and that has to be removed with the file and we need a flush surface to work with. We don't want any raised sections whatsoever. And uh, this is a typical burr here which needs to be removed and cleaned up. The drilling has worked out rather well because these two drill bits, one at either end, are identical size to the holes and when you push them through, uh, if the holes weren't lined up correctly on each piece, obviously the drill bit wouldn't go through. So we've got a bit of a win-win there. And then we take that to the drill press again so that we can drill the centre hole, but we're going to drill them all at once. So the stop has been set up so that I can get somewhere around near the middle there. And for a bit of insurance, I've also clamped a piece of timber here against those pieces of aluminium to hold them for me properly while I drill the hole. And that's the end result. We still have to uh, round off the ends of the rockers, but the holes here have been countersunk to accept the little black screws and uh, leaves less of the screw protruding out from the, the part here and less uh, things to catch on when the levers are in action. So it's exactly the same parts as the levers going on here. And as I said, we need to round the enders, the ends of the rockers uh, to allow the uh, brass uh, terminal block in it to rotate say 180 degrees around that not it doesn't have to rotate 180 degrees but it has to rotate part of the way around and if there was a square on the end on there you wouldn't be able to rotate it as far as it you wanted it to go so we put all that together again with Loctite and everything to hold the parts in place and we've made up a frame for it and that will go on the back and it's lined up carefully, the, uh, the bottom of the rockers are lined up carefully with the bottom of the levers and a careful measurement is taken because you also need to have this end of the rocker, the top end, just below the baseboard. You don't want it rubbing on the under of, underneath of the baseboard. Uh, then I've taken some um, wire coat hanger, straightened it by putting one end in the vise uh, the other end in a drill, locking it off, pulling it tight and turning the drill on, twisting the wire straightens the wire. So we've got some nice straight coat hanger wire here and we need to determine the length of the rods that we need to use in this situation and to do that the rockers have been pushed all the way to the backboard and the lever is, pushed, is pulled all the way back to its uh, furthest uh, range of movement. And the size that I need in the end was 60 millimeters, so we need five rods, 60 millimeters each. You can see here how the lever was pulled all the way back. And the rocker's up against the backboard there. So now we start fitting the rods. And uh, they have to be done in sequence actually, otherwise you can't access the screws properly. But that's another story. It's quite simple really. And here we are finished, and there's a bit of spare rod hanging out there in case adjustments are required at any time. Uh, then we start working on the, uh, on the uh, box itself. Now, I use cabothane on these uh, bits of timber. It's, it's like a clear varnish. However, it has a very glossy finish and I don't really like the glossy finish. Uh, I prefer more of a satin finish or an old but cared for look. That's uh, what I've been working with for years actually. And uh, so what I do with it is um, uh, put the, uh, a coat of cabothane on. There will be three coats altogether, but I put one coat on, let that uh, cure obviously overnight, 
and then rub it back hard with some um, steel wool and this is the finest grade of steel wool you can buy it's four zeros and it, you rub the finish back to this sort of state here where it looks like there's no finish on it at all there's actually one coat of finish on there and then you repeat you give it another coat of cabothane and then do the same with the second coat and then with the third coat once you get there uh, you rub it back with this uh, steel wool back to this really uh, finish that's uh, dull I suppose you would have to say and uh, once you're at that stage you've got a you will finish up with a very nice smooth finish but there's no shine to it so then we take some beeswax and this is uh, actually more of a polish really this one but the critical thing is that it's got beeswax in it it must have beeswax and this one's handmade in Mandaring Western Australia of all places um, beeswax I've used in the past has been of a totally different consistency um, and this one is very soft by comparison this is more like a toothpaste consistency so anyway you get some of this polish on a cloth and you rub it in hard you really work it into the material and then uh, remove the excess and then you come back with a, a, another clean cloth and uh, buff it off and buff and buff and buff until you get a nice satin smooth finish and it comes out like this and uh, yeah a nice uh, nice to the feel actually there's no little pimples or bumps or anything on this finish whatsoever it's really smooth to the touch as smooth as a baby's bottom that's the finished article still awaiting combing and a uh, bit of artwork to go in the back of it and there we've fitted it in place. There's uh, a screw coming down vertically into the, uh, the side walls here of the box. And uh, on top, you can just about see them, but they'll be covered over with um, ballast anyway. And at this stage now, we need to, uh, once it's fitted into the, the baseboard and everything, we need to um, start working out how we're going to connect it up to the points. So I used some masking tape to work out the, the easiest line to each point. And what I'm going for is, is straight lines in each case, and I'll be using bell cranks uh, because I'm using a uh, cable. This cable is actually from the hardware store, and it's used to put up uh, temporary curtains, I think. So it's basically the same as a brake cable off a push bike. So you've got that inner core of wound metal. And then there's a plastic sleeve over that, this white plastic sleeve. Uh, however, there's no cable in it. And you can, you can fit um, some hooks into the end of it. They can screw into it and you can hook it up. Uh, so I've used that as cable. Everything's a straight run. However, I'm running... I think it's 0.8 of a millimetre galvanised wire through it. And again, this is straightened. Everything has to be straight. Uh, otherwise, you get friction in the system, too much friction. And if you try and sort of go around curves and everything with this system, you get a lot more play in the system. So straight is the way to go. Over here, we've used a little half connector. So that's one of the uh, connectors you saw earlier that's been cut in half and that's a stopper so that limits the movement of the wire within the cables to protect the points there's one on the other end as well and that extends out to a tile spacer that is used as a bell crank there's actually another short thickness of tile spacer underneath this to lift it off the baseboard and that's connected to another wire in tube cable if you like uh, which is bent here at a right angle that goes straight up through the tie bar in the point and all of these bits of cable are held on uh, quite effectively with four millimeter cable clips there's the uh, half connector doing its job there and uh, yes here we are with um, another situation where the uh, layout has been worked out this one here actually goes to the next baseboard so that made things interesting as well but we've got a video which shows how the, all this sort of stuff is laid out so we might go to that now
Well folks, here's the underside of, uh, there's actually two boards here. This is all set up with the wire and tube system. Uh, you'll notice here that I have um, tile spaces as bell cranks on the initial uh, feed from the point itself. Uh, but when we get to the, uh, the feed over here from the lever itself, uh, I've used my original bell cranks which are much sturdier. The, uh, the tile spaces can't handle the pressure at this joint. Um, I've, I've actually not tried on these short ones here, but I tried it first on this lower one, which is quite long, which is about a, a run of a metre, and uh, it just couldn't handle the pressure on that particular joint there. So I've elected to uh, go with the original bell cranks um, with the connection up to the lever. So yeah, that's uh, all five points done. This one's rather interesting because that's a baseboard join there. And um, what I've done is I've, I've run a bit of wire out here with a full length terminal block connector on there. And the, uh, the theory is that um, once the boards are put in place, I will just have to um, loosen off this connection here on the bell crank loosen this first connection here which releases this wire in here it allows that to slide backwards and forwards and all I have to do is once the baseboards are in place is get up underneath slide that into position there lock it off and then lock it off here and that's done and um, this is the only point as well that has a slightly different um, setup on the top I've used a bit of wire uh, to activate the point on top of the point and uh, it's it's different to the others altogether but uh, it's worked out quite well so you finish up with a wire coming out of the uh, the baseboard here on top of the point I've put a bit of wire down through the tie bar and that's bent at 90 degrees and then that goes back away from the tie bar about two sleepers does another righty another 90 degree turn comes down through the baseboard here and then I've bent again at 90 degrees so if you move that um, wire up and down it actually moves the point on, on top of the board so I've just had a, uh, a simple loop in a wire here connected onto that but I've put two half connectors here to stop the wire sliding uh, out of position so in theory I mean if I wanted um, more movement in the lever and less movement in the point I could slide that wire to the left uh, if you move it to the right you um, reduce the movement so it, it's pretty simple really you can see through the crack there that the the uh, tie bar is moving up above simple here's an example of the movement so we just pull the lever and that pulls the main bell crank which activates the wire which activates the tile spacer bell crank which runs up to the point and away we go simple as that folks one next to it same again and that one and this is the one that was furthest away Now this point here at the very end and the uh, its opposite number at the very far end of the one meter run they are both electro frog points so I will be fitting um, a micro switch which is um, like that very simple little micro switch on off uh, and it'll be activated by the uh, the bell crank here so if I just hold that in position and move the bell crank you can see how it touches the micro switch so that'll have to be fitted on before I put the boards back on there's other things to do as well but yeah just two uh, two points to worry about with electro frogs uh, and the micro switch will change the frog polarity the others will be fine okay So once all the uh, connections were made underneath the board, uh, it was time just to uh, sort out the wiring and uh, connect up the micro switches, etc. Get everything sorted out wiring wise before the boards went back on top of the layout. 
Uh, while the boards were off, I painted the uh, front piece of the framing here black. Also drilled a hole here to uh, allow wires to pass through for the control panel. And uh, speaking of wiring, this section of timber here with the terminal blocks fitted to the top of it is hinged at, at this side and uh, there's a catch under this side uh, which allows that to drop down under the layout so there's easy access to the wiring if it needs to be uh, accessed. Uh, it's much easier than taking the boards off the top. And also I was working on the um, design for the control panel and this is uh, a draft copy printed out uh, basically to make sure that the size was right and uh, I was on the right track with the design. Now things were changed because of this, you know, when you see it in place you can sort of say, oh no, that looks wrong or that should be moved or whatever. Anyway, I uh, used this information I gained from doing this to uh, refine the design and, and eventually come up with something that works. Here's the boards back on and uh, we're ready to start feeding wiring through so we need a control panel to actually do this. And the control panel is made up from some of that timber that I uh, dressed through the uh, thickness of just a while back uh, and a piece of uh, three ply. And uh, in the timber framing I've cut a, a rebate to allow the uh, three ply to slide in there quite easily and you, you're bearing in mind that you've got a thickness of um, laminated paper to go on top of this as well so the idea is to make the rebate big enough for the uh, combination of the ply and the laminated uh, the schematic to go in there and slide easily but you know not too not too well you, you don't want it too loose but um, yeah it's it's a nice fit and then the, uh, the framing was mounted on the layout at 45 degrees and uh, you can see the locating uh, screws here but there's also three screws going up underneath vertical into the bottom of the, uh, the layout itself and of course it won't move, it's uh, pretty sturdy. The bottom's removable to obviously to allow the panel to slide in and out and uh, it's the same system as I've used on the uh, point lever frame where these ends will be rounded etc. So you can just pull it off like that then you slide the, uh, the panel in and then uh, it sits there quite comfortably. It's, as I say the fit is just about right for it to sit there without uh, any, uh, anything holding it in. And the beauty of this system is that if you wanted to work on the wiring for an extended period on the back of this, you could slide it out, flip it over, slide it back in and then you can uh, work on the wiring. Now this is the uh, final uh, uh, control panel and I was intending to use uh, a home built um, controller. I've made two of these before quite successfully and uh, this particular one I have identical parts everything's laid out exactly the same but it doesn't work and uh, I checked everything three or four or five times I don't know and I tried all different combinations of parts and everything replacing parts but it didn't work and in the end I just gave up I thought this is too hard so I've ordered one online from Melbourne so I'm still waiting on that to come and hopefully it'll be a, a good replacement for uh, for this one here I still haven't worked out what could possibly be wrong but there, obviously there's something but anyway it'll do your head in trying to work that out. So then we um, took the frame off for the control panel, uh, clamped it to the workmate and started the uh, process with the cabothane polishing and uh, varnishing and uh, all that sort of thing. Exactly the same process and it came up a little bit like that and uh, she's all set to go there with uh, switches in all set to go. We just need that controller. And then uh, I started focusing on the, uh, the, the track because um, this, this layer was part of the layer was actually given to me and I've adapted it a bit. So this section here where you can see the more coarse gravel, uh, that was a bit of track that I've put in there. 
I think there was originally a point in there, but anyway, I've put a straight piece of track in there and I've tried to match the ballast with some ballast that I've made up. It's a bit more coarse than the original ballast. And of course, all this uh, section of track here that was moved, all that had to be ballast plus the point. And there's other sections here as well. You can probably just make them out by the, the coarseness of the ballast. You can see here with the point, it's got the coarse ballast and there's a bit up here somewhere, I think, and there's some down there. There's definitely some up there somewhere. Anyway, yeah, so that was uh, the next thing. And uh, I was also um, adding a bit of colour to the track as well. So, um, yeah, I've put a, an undercoat basically of grey on the uh, edge of the uh, platform. Uh, that really needs another coat. And uh, on top I've put a brown, I think it's burnt umber, undercoat and what's happening there is there will be uh, a, a paving strip along the edge of the platform and behind that it'll be backfilled with a, a fine sand or something that whatever I can find uh, and then there'll be a, a strip of that and probably some grass and uh, you know obviously a bit of a garden uh, station fencing all that sort of thing um, yeah like a typical uh, country station hopefully and uh, when the uh, boards were fitted back in, you know, I have this, I had this big gaping hole here, a triangular section, and I thought, well, it'd be nice to cover that up, so I put some three-ply on top here and sort of covered up that. And while I was on the job, I thought, well, why not put a tunnel mouth here for the entrance to the um, removable cassette uh, fiddle yard that I've got here? And because I've got these two electrical connections here, well, I, I had to use uh, a double track uh, tunnel mouth, which I had anyway. It was just hanging around. Uh, so I've put that on there. And there's behind there, there's a strip of metal, and I've got a couple of magnets uh, so that I can actually remove that if I need to. The tunnel mouth comes off so I can give me a bit better access into the track in there if I need to clean it or something like that. Yeah, it's... Uh, strange tunnel with those two prongs sticking out of it. Anyway, the board that sits on top here at the back between the station and the wall is the cover for the fiddle yard that's underneath and then originally this board was approximately six foot long. Now when I have removed it, uh, it's probably what would it be four or five ply or something like that. When I've removed it in the past, um, you've got to be very careful in the room. There's not a lot of room to swing something that size around. So you've got to be careful how you move and then you've got to find somewhere to put the blessed thing. So I thought, well, if I have scenery on top of this, um, it's going to be even worse trying to move this thing around. So what I decided to do was cut the board in half. So I've got two, let's say, three-foot sections. And in the middle of each three-foot section, uh, I, I actually found the balance point. So it, in, on this board it's here and I've put this threaded rod through which is way too long at the moment it's got to be trimmed down but I put this threaded rod through with a little handle up here and what you can do now is you can pick that up with one hand quite safely and move it about the room and, and put it down safely somewhere so the, the plan is to um, that's the base that's the join there the plan is to cut that down to uh, a size where it's just above this, the scenery when it's finished and there will be a little cottage above each one, a removable cottage. So when you want to take the panel out, you lift the little cottage off and then you, you've presented with this handle here that, where you can lift up the um, scenic section and just take it away safely and place it somewhere, wherever that may be. I haven't worked that one out yet. You can see how easily it moves. What have we done here, folks? What's happened? We'll go back to full screen. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, here we go. Uh, yes, we're looking at the ballasting again. Uh, yes, this section here was uh, a new section that was ballast. Ballasted it. Ballast? Received ballast. Ballastized. And uh, at this point here... I'm exploring the possibility of putting a panel in this gaping hole here and um, so I'm taking measurements and working out exactly how long it should be and how it should fit in etc 
And uh, yeah, it was always the intention to um, do something like that. Uh, and um, so I started working on that. This is the artwork for the, the um, lever frame. So that goes in the back of the box. That's the uh, lever numbers. That will go on the removable section at the front. And these uh, other bits and pieces will be stuck on all over the joint. Yeah, so here's the, uh, the panel. Uh, it's got a beveled edge on this side so it uh, fits nicely up against the wall there. And uh, it's actually screwed into this section here and we've got a little uh, exit hole here. Uh, there will be a bridge going across there with a, a girder plate in it and uh, the scenery will be up around this height actually. So all this flat area will be gone. But e even so, uh, we're having issues here too folks, I don't know what's going on. Even so, um, it's good to get an idea of how things might look, so I was trying a bit of uh, scenery from time to time, just backgrounds, just to get a feel for how things might work out. And um, the, the scene, the back scenes will flow around all the way around, obviously. And, you know, you might think, well, what's going to happen at this join here? But if you raise this section up here to match this one that's already on the wall, it, the join there will practically disappear. The one up here won't disappear, but the, the join uh, where the uh, backgrounds meet will. Yeah, so um, I made a new fascia to go on the front uh, of the uh, layout here and I've included enough um, fascia here to create a brick wall because this section of track here where the little jinty is was so close to the edge of the, uh, the layout that uh, I was worried about um, a train doing the leap of death off there so I've, I'm going to turn that into a brick wall and uh, it's got plenty of height to protect the trains and uh, I think probably I'll do a continuation of that but I'll, I'll do a wire fence or something going along here so Yes, you can see that the wall is um, high enough to protect the trains there. This is a shelf I've just recently fitted underneath the layout. That's actually underneath uh, the Stonehenge area and the airfield. And that's to take the transformer to power this section. It will be powered uh, separately. So here's the uh, brick wall going on. Um, it's scale scenes brick paper and the piers are made from scale scenes brick paper stuck to a cereal packet card uh, and there's 39 on each side stuck on with PVA. The inside hadn't been done at that stage and the way they're um, put on accurately is to use a set square. The width of the rule on the set square is 25 millimeters so that's um, a bit over six foot in scale measurement uh, between the piers so I thought well that, that'll do that's good enough and uh, the process is to uh, fit your first pier accurately and then bring the set square back to it butt up to it and then place the next pier against the other side of the, uh, the rule on the set square and um, yeah push it up and make sure it sits down uh, nice and level with the top as well and these little clips are what I used to hold the coping on so both sides have been uh, done with the piers and now the coping's on as well now the uh, one of the removable boards um, actually went under the new blue panel 
that was uh, fitted. So I've, I've cut the board to uh, only just meet the uh, new blue panel. Plus there was a bit of a hole in the board. And um, on this side here, um, it needed to be extended just a bit, a little as well. So I've just uh, glued a bit of um, three millimeter MDF on there to uh, to do that. And uh, there'll be a polystyrene being stuck on top of this, so you won't even know uh, that that was there eventually, and it's going to be just like that. So that's uh, 105 millimeters thick, folks, and uh, that needs to be shaped and worked on and all that sort of thing. Okay, folks, well, that's it, and uh, so uh, thanks for watching, and um, I'll uh, put another update, update out uh, for uh, November, and uh, I don't know how much will be done by then, but um, I'll see you then. Cheers. Gourmet.